A warm welcome to those joining us both on site and online. My name is Dr. Melanie Barrett. I am professor and chair of the Department of Moral Theology here at the University of St. Mary of the Lake Mundelein Seminary. In 1990, Joseph Cardinal Bernadine, Archbishop of Chicago and Chancellor of the University of St. Mary of the Lake, announced the establishment of the Chester and Margaret Pollock Chair of Theology at Mundelein Seminary. The purpose of the chair is to foster theological studies in the intellectual life of the seminary and the university by bringing leading scholars to lecture on the seminary campus. We remain grateful to the Pollock family for their longtime support of Mundelein Seminary with the continued engagement of Mary Lou Pollock Rafferty, who recently was named an emeritus member of Mundelein Seminary's Board of Advisors. Today, it is my distinct privilege to introduce our current Pollock Chair, Dr. William Bill Murphy. Dr. Murphy is Professor of Moral Theology at the Pontifical College Josephinum in Columbus, Ohio, where he also edited the Josephinum Journal of Theology for 15 years. After an earlier career in engineering and information technology, he earned an STL from the Dominican House of Studies and an STD, a Sacred Theology Doctorate, from the John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and the Family. Dr. Murphy has held faculty appointments at various institutions, including the University of Notre Dame. He also has published widely in moral theology on its Pauline foundations, on Thomistic ethics, and on the philosophical aspects of disputed questions in the field. This latter work involved a collaboration with the Swiss philosopher Martin Ronheimer, resulting in the publication of four books through Catholic University of America Press that Dr. Murphy edited. The most relevant of these to today's lecture is entitled The Common Good of Constitutional Democracy, Essays in Political Philosophy and on Catholic Social Teaching, which was published in 2012. His current research project is Social Catholicism for the 21st Century, of which his Pollock lectures have been a part, and in which he also has collaborated with Ohio State University's Center for Ethics and Human Values. He is preparing an edited volume under that same title as well. In the two public lectures that Dr. Murphy presented here last year, he established a foundation for social Catholicism through critical engagements with liberalism, conservatism, St. Paul, St. Thomas Aquinas, and Catholic social doctrine. If you missed those lectures, not to worry, you can read them in the upcoming issue of Chicago Studies. Just go to the USML website, click on Chicago Studies, and you can subscribe to future issues of the journal at no cost. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Bill Murphy. Thank you very much, Dr. Barrett. I'm once again honored and delighted to give the Pallack Lecture, and I thank the Pallack family for their generous support of the seminary and the Archdiocese of Chicago for the invitation. I will begin with some introductory remarks that locate today's topic in light of my first two lectures before getting into the topic as indicated by my title, which is Three Rival Versions of Social Inquiry, subtitle Three Contemporary Alternatives to Social Catholicism. The first one is the more catchy title alluding to a famous book. Uh, the second one is more the uh, focus of my lecture. So my first Pallack lecture from the fall of pandemic year 2020 was entitled Liberalism, Conservatism and Social Catholicism for the 21st Century? Question mark. Drawing on the whole tradition of Catholic social teaching, I spoke of social Catholicism as a non-ideological and non-partisan mode of social and political engagement guided by the principles of Catholic social teaching to address the primary challenges of a given time. Lest one object that this doesn't sound much like the main social message we hear in the Catholic Church in the United States today, let me note that by this social Catholicism, I simply mean the, quote, integral and solidary humanism, end quote, that provides the heading for the introduction 
for the Compendium of Catholic Social Doctrine. This excellent volume was published during the pontificate of John Paul II, and this phrase functions within it as almost a definition of Catholic social teaching, taking into account the whole preceding tradition. This understanding aligns nicely with Pope Francis's emphasis on social friendship and solidarity. According to the compendium, we should note that this integral and solidary humanism is the way of living out charity in the modern world, and it is the authentically Catholic way to evangelize. There were some key takeaways from this first lecture to keep in mind regarding liberalism and conservatism that are prerequisites to this afternoon's lecture. Regarding liberalism in the sense of constitutional democracy, a key point was that there are forms of it that flourished with the support of Catholics after World War II when we reconciled with it, but that it is increasingly unstable to the extent that Catholics have been alienated from it, particularly due to some of the illiberal tendencies of the left, such as hostility to pro-life Democrats, for example. It's pretty hard to be one of those. Uh, regarding conservatism, a key takeaway was that there were forms of it congenial to Catholicism and others that were in significant tension with especially Catholic social teaching. The former version of conservatism that is amenable to Catholicism is a stance that appreciates the past and seeks to moderate the pace of social change while accepting constitutional governance. The latter version more or less rejects constitutional governance that Catholic social teaching explicitly favors as most in keeping with the dignity of the human person, with justice, with the common good, with human rights, etc. In my second Pallet lecture entitled St. Paul, St. Thomas, and Social Catholicism as an Agent of Social Healing, I sought to show that such as social Catholicism was consistent with some of the most foundational teachings of the inspired biblical texts at the root of our tradition and with the most trusted medieval synthesis of the faith by St. Thomas Aquinas. In so doing, I revisited the call of the Second Vatican Council for a biblical renewal of moral theology that would help the faithful, as the Council Fathers thought, saw it, to realize their, quote, most high calling in Christ, end quote, for holiness of life in Christian charity, and thereby to, quote, bear fruit for the life of the world, end quote. I, att I attempted to illustrate the poten potential fecundity of this unrealized but prescient call for a renewal of moral theology by reviewing some of the most programmatic aspects of Pauline thought that articulate this most high calling. These, of course, start with the centrality of charity, which can be understood as a zealous Christiform impetus to build up our brothers and sisters into the communion of the church. Building on such key biblical insights, I illustrated how Thomas's moral theology provides invaluable resources to help us grasp the intelligibility of these inspired Pauline insights into the Christian life, such as St. Thomas's elucidation of charity as a form of friendship, where we act for the good of others, building them up in the communion of friendship with God and neighbor. By recalling such central New Testament themes and how they are articulated by this common doctor of the church, we can see how Pope Francis's emphasis on living out what he calls social friendship in a spirit of fraternity and solidarity is not a novelty, but reflects the deepest wellsprings of the Christian tradition. Following the organizing thrust of the compendium of the social doctrine of the church, I explained how a life guided by the principles of our social teaching should be understood, uh, to reiterate a point I made in passing, the, the way that the church has been directing Catholics to live out charity so it bear, bears fruit in the world, thereby enabling the church to be an efficacious sign and instrument of unity that the world so badly needs. Living out this social friendship guided by the principles of Catholic social teaching is, according to the compendium, the Catholic way of evangelizing. Few, if any today, however, would argue that the church has realized the internal renewal implied in the universal call to holiness or brought about the societal leavening that the fathers of the Second Vatican Council hoped to follow. Rather than a Catholicism marked by renewal ad intra, 
bearing fruit ad extra in societies renewed by the spirit of Christ, we talk too often show more the characteristics of a church enfeebled by reflecting the worst features of modern cultures, where the selfishness of individualism or the tribe, whether the selfishness or of individualism or the tribal polarization of recent years. This is not to deny that many Catholics live out various aspects of our social tradition in exemplary ways. Many others, however, have little awareness of it, such that the Catholic social teaching is also often called by its advocates, the church's best kept secret. Indeed, some of the most prominent social and political visions that influence especially American Catholics are quite distinct from the integral and solidary humanism of Catholic social teaching in which we work collaboratively with our fellow citizens toward an integral understanding of salvation that addresses the real needs for temporal goods. Such alternative visions have long been widely and effectively promoted by Catholics or former Catholics to influence the broader Catholic population. In this third Pallet lecture, therefore, I will introduce a significant reason why I think that especially in the United States, there is too little audience for a social Catholicism along the lines called for by Pope Francis and grounded in the key documents of the, of the tradition, whether the social encyclicals, the conciliar documents, or the compendium published during the pontificate of John Paul II. This reason is that alternative perspectives dominate the intellectual and cultural venues that influence Catholics and the broader population. In what follows, therefore, I will provide a concise overview of three of what I think can be understood as the most prominent contemporary alternatives to this social Catholicism that characterizes the social teaching of the Magisterium. Leaving aside the radical traditionalism and Catholic integralism associated especially with the schismatic Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, which could have also been discussed as a significant contemporary alternative to social Catholicism, these include the following. The first is a new articulation of perhaps the most widespread alternative. This is self-described, this includes a self-described radical critique of magisterial Catholic social teaching since John the 23rd that articulates a corresponding proposal to instead focus our social efforts on combating intrinsically evil acts. The second is the so-called Benedict option that initially focuses on cultivating intense forms of Christian life to withstand an imminent soft totalitarianism of the left. The third is a radical anti-liberalism holding that liberalism, apparently but ambiguously including constitutional democracy, is radically flawed and thus in antithetical to Catholicism, where radically is understood from the etymology of the Latin radix, meaning root, or from its very metaphysical roots. Although I have distinguished them, these three alternatives have significant overlaps and all seem to reflect a more conservative approach than manifest in the documents of Catholic social teaching and a greater alignment with growing contemporary opposition to constitutional democracy, which is a reflection of the fact that today's conservatism has been moving from a moderating force within a democratic consensus to a more radical alternative. This shift in Christian conservatism is evident in the, quote, Christian nationalism that has long percolated among evangelical Protestants. It's also present in the integralism of the radical traditionalists and in proposals for a new nationalism or an advocacy of an illiberal democracy, and also present in various overlapping forms of post-liberalism, which is one of the more uh, consensus terms for these various movements today. Because each of these alternatives involves extensive bodies of thought that are advanced by brilliant thinkers who are prolific writers and committed Christians, they each deserve a detailed and nuanced consideration. But that is not possible within our limited time today. 
In what follows, I can only sketch some of the key features of each approach and some of the primary reasons why I think that especially Catholics should instead embrace a social Catholicism as I have described it above. At the risk of monotony, let me just reiterate that this is a non-ideological, non-partisan mode of social engagement to address the key challenges of a given time, guided by the principles of Catholic social teaching. I will proceed in three steps discussing each rival approach in turn. Because I want to leave time for questions, I will touch only briefly on the third alternative uh, before moving to my conclusion and then perhaps say more about it, depending on how the questions go. So number one, a radical critique of Catholic social teaching and a proposal to focus on opposing intrinsic evils. A recent and detailed advance of this perspective is found in a volume of essays entitled Catholic Social Teaching, a collection of scholarly essays edited by Gerald V. Bradley and E. Christian Brugger. This substantial volume is comprised of an introduction plus 23 essays. Both the quality of the many contributions and the way it supports what seems to be the majority view among leading American Catholics make it a required reference for those working in the field. Although many of the essays aren't grounded in a strong critique of magisterial Catholic social, social teaching and don't explicitly advance the rival approach focused on opposing intrinsic evils, the programmatic parts of the book, such as the introduction, the concluding essay by John Finnis, which is entitled A Radical Critique of Catholic Social Teaching, and other essays make this key focus of the book unmistakably clear. Radical critique plus alternative. For the sake of consensus, the key messages, including in this reading of Catholic social teaching, for the sake of conciseness, the key messages included in this reading of Catholic social teaching could be paraphrased and enumerated as follows. With those interested in more extended and precise formulations referred to the text itself, especially the introduction and the concluding essay. First, since Catholic social teaching is part of Catholic moral theology and questions of intrinsic evil like abortion or other attacks on life and the family unit are more clearly defined in the church and important, so social action should focus on confronting them. Second, matters of social policy are questions of prudence and the magisterium has no special competence to speak on them. The magisterium should therefore stop speaking about them with any particularity on, for example, the urgency of addressing issues like climate change or inequality. Third, the social documents have said far too much on particular questions already, and future magisterial statements should be much more concise in the range of at most a small number of pages per year. Fourth, any ecclesial statements on particular social questions should be highly qualified to indicate that these are matters left to personal prudence. Fifth, in light of the above points, ecclesial institutions for promoting Catholic social thought, in particular the Roman dicastery for the promotion of integral human development should be shuttered. Although these and other texts illustrate that intelligent and accomplished Catholic scholars can make a serious argument for such a view of Catholic social teaching, the approach seems to me to be misguided for at least several reasons. A, it is a doubling down on an approach that I think has failed. Uh, so my first objection to this alternative is that it's a doubling down on what seems to be a failed approach. Over the last 20 years, when the church in the United States has increasingly focused on a political alliance to confront these moral issues of intrinsic evil, the percentage of the US population identifying as Catholic has declined by about 20%, a 1% yearly decline that would quickly reduce Catholics to a small minority were it to continue. While it is beyond my present scope to weigh the various factors contributing to this decline, there is no doubt that prominent engagement in culture war struggles alienates significant portions of the population. When we looked at the young, moreover, we see an increasing alienation of them from the church. And the prominence of our public alliance around these issues is a significant reason 
that many of these young see the church as not just judgmental about morality, but hypocritical given our widespread moral failures and scandals. If Catholics instead exemplified living out Catholic social teaching, they would align with many of the deepest concerns for the future held by the young and, and uh, be less alienating. So it's hard for me to imagine how a doubling down on culture war battles would not exacerbate the problem of alienating youth and other major parts of society. But other intelligent American Catholics would contest this. To those who would contest it, I'd like to have a long discussion about how this emphasis has been significantly conceived, funded, and facilitated by structures created to facilitate an unregulated form of capitalism and other questionable goals. Uh, for people interested in some of this work, I'd, I'd recommend Nancy McLean's Democracy and Chains, which focuses on some of the economic issues, Heather Cox Richardson's How the South Won the Civil War, or Jane Meyer's Dark Money, which talks a lot about how a lot of the uh, dark money uh, has funded a lot of the uh, movement to uh, basically facilitate unregulated capitalism. Uh, that is one of the benefits you get from, from the uh, recent social alliances. It has been many years, moreover, since one could reasonably foresee the possibility of reducing intrinsically evil actions like elective abortions or the destruction of human embryos through democratic processes in the United States. Since the collapse of American neoconservatism with the George W. Bush administration in the, in the 2008 timeframe, moreover, the most tempting approach to advance conservative moral priorities, like overturning Roe v. Wade or banning gay marriage, has been through what has increasingly come to involve a departure from majoritarian democratic rule. Such a departure, however, would be in direct opposition to much of what we find, for example, in the compendium of Catholic social doctrine regarding the political community and human rights. Number 406 of the compendium, for example, accurately reflects our tradition in asserting that the church cannot encourage the formation of narrow ruling groups which usurp the power of the state for individual interests or for ideological ends. The Grise Finis Boyle school of thought that shapes this volume, however, has generally been supportive of constitutional democracy, although striving for a greater reflection of moral law in civil law than has been politically feasible, such as enforcing sodomy laws in an earlier book some years ago. Looking ahead in my presentation, it may be helpful to note that such basic support for constitutional democracy weakens considerably in the second and third alternatives to social Catholicism that I discussed below. B, this is my second objection to this approach. It reflects an acceleration of some excesses in the Grise Finis Boyle school of thought. As those familiar with the last several decades of Catholic moral theology will recognize, the Grise Finis Boyle School has been at the forefront of defending the existence of intrinsically evil acts against more revisionist or relativist approaches. Although I agree that defending that view, that the view that some kinds of human acts are always evil is a laudable goal toward which I have also expended considerable labor, I would raise three concerns about their way of doing it. First, I think that adherents of this school have focused too much on defending the moral law and not enough on manifesting the beauty of the virtuous life. Second, I would argue that they have tended to be overly rigorous, more Catholic than the Pope, on some open questions that have come up over the years with the CDF, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, intervening in ways unfavorable to their positions, which, not surprisingly for those of us inclined to intellectual debate, they continued to hold. Third, I think that they were often too belligerent towards those they called dissenters. Thus, I was not surprised that they would attempt to place their emphasis on combating intrinsic evil at the center of Catholic social teaching, which in my opinion is another example of being excessive in pursuit of the laudable goal of upholding a sense of moral objectivity. C. 
a lack of a proper sense of ecclesial communion. The third objection that I would raise against this radical critique of and alternative to the integral and solidary humanism and social friendship that the magisterium has advocated in its social teaching is the following. It's contrary to a proper sense of ecclesial communion. As number 25 of the Second Vatican Council's Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church affirms, even more so than the obsequium religiosum granted to bishops, a quote, religious submission of the mind and will must be shown in a special way to the authentic magisterium of the Roman pontiff, even when he is not speaking ex cathedra. Now, in presenting his radical critique of Catholic social teaching and their alternative, John Finnis and his collaborators are responding not just to the social teaching of Pope Francis, but to that of his predecessors back to at least St. John the 23rd, including Benedict XVI and Saints John Paul II and Paul VI, all of whom express profound continuity with their predecessors. And I think you see that if you study the documents over, to, over the years, it, there's, there's really a profound continuity from Rerum Navarum culminating right in the compendium. Although there is room for debate regarding precisely how this subsequium religiosum should be understood and lived, I think the approach of a radical critique plus an alternative clearly misses the mark. D, failure to recognize and address crucial social issues of our day. Another reason why I think this doubling down on a social strategy centered on battling intrinsic evils is misguided is that it turns our attention away from what are arguably the central social questions of our day for those that, while continuing to have their own importance, need to be thoughtfully located amidst a frightening set of current and impending challenges. The contemporary issues emphasized by the Holy Father in complete harmony with the relevant scientific consensus and the most thoughtful commentators include the following. Although emphasizing this first contemporary challenge in a Catholic context has sometimes been a contentious matter, I assume our Catholic conversations are increasingly grounded in evidence and by thoughtful discussion, especially to give just one example, given the massive fires, clouds of smoke and water shortages that have plagued our West Coast. So the first contemporary challenge I mentioned is the existential one of human induced climate change, especially global warming. This issue has a special urgency because according to the strong scientific consensus among the relevant experts, and the growing evidence across the world, significant action must be taken soon, i.e. in the next decade, to avoid reaching tipping points that would lock in horrific consequences for humanity, not just for some remote generation, but in the lives of many on campus today. The second is the increasing inequality where the top 1% enjoy fabulous wealth, whereas the majority struggle for a modicum of security. The third challenge Pope Francis highlights is the mass migration that the first two challenges threaten to exacerbate. More recently, it seems necessary to highlight the destabilization of democratic constitutional governance in international institutions that threaten not only national and international peace and order, but the ability to, to collaborate in addressing an array of global challenges. Given that the beginning of modern Catholic social teaching is generally marked by the intervention of Leo XIII's 1891 encyclical Rerum Novarum, focused on addressing the major social questions of that day regarding the situation of workers amidst the Industrial Revolution, where he vigorously condemned the injustice of justices against the vulnerable and offered the best proposals of the day, it is hard to imagine that the proper social response of contemporary Catholics would be to leave these central questions of our day to personal prudence. To do so would be to renounce the main thrust of the papal magisterium for a principled social friendship 
over the entire post-war period and to double down on a strategy that does not seem to be working. Uh, and it would be to miss an opportunity to an embrace an, impro an approach that would bring a desperately needed alternative to contemporary tribalism and place the church in the forefront of addressing the challenges of our time, which in an era when the church is rapidly hemorrhaging members and an affront to many young, would be to recover a properly Catholic sense of evangelization as understood in the social tradition. Number two, the Benedict option for Christian dissidents resisting the impending soft totalitarianism of the left. The second influential alternative to the social Catholicism in the form of this integral and solidary humanism of the compendium is articulated especially by Rod Dreher, a former Catholic who is still widely influential among Catholics, including many clergy and seminarians. He articulates his views, especially in his recent best-selling books, including his 2018, The Benedict Option, A Strategy for Christians in a Post-Christian Nation, and his 2020, Live Not by Lies, a manual for Christian dissidents, both of which are complemented by his prolific blogging on the American conservative website. As indicated by the subtitle, the primary focus of the Benedict Option is to offer a strategy for Christians to survive and flourish in a post-Christian nation. That strategy centers on forming intense Christian communities to maintain and pass on the faith. This primary message was rightly well received among especially conservative Christians because the present cultural context that Dreher describes as liquid modernity has proven to be particularly uncongenial to cultivating and transmitting the faith. Although some, perhaps influenced by the connotations of the heading Benedict Option, misunderstand Dreher to be encouraging a withdrawal from the world, he is far more nuanced and encourages Christians to do what they can in society, but emphasizes that the scope of such activity is increasingly limited given the growing hostility of the elite liberal culture toward people like himself. To focus, the focus of Dreher's most recent book is again indicated by especially the subtitle, namely, A Manual for Christian Dissidents. It is written to prepare a Christian resistance movement to withstand an impending soft totalitarianism of the left. The book is inspired by the reflections of survivors of the totalitarianism of the Soviet bloc and draws an analogy between that earlier totalitarianism and the excesses of the illiberal left in the United States and the Western world today. By illiberal left, I mean those of the political and social left who are willing to violate the rights of others, such as their freedoms of conscience, of speech, of assembly, of religion, in order to further their social agenda. These illiberal excesses are grouped under headings including identity politics, gender ideology, political correctness, campus speech codes, social justice warriors, and cancel culture all of which become more threatening with the data gathering and technological monitoring that has emerged through the growth of surveillance capitalism. As Dreher sees it and illustrates with frequent examples, this soft totalitarianism of the left is an acute threat to conservative Christians like him in coercing them to go along with the lies, alluding to his title, entailed in these ideological extremes. Dreher's blog provides a plethora of posts critiquing and ridiculing the excesses of the illiberal left to alert and mobilize his readers regarding the impending threat of what he sometimes calls a pink police state. One can agree with much of what Dreher highlights as excesses of the left, and many do agree. There is even a growing body of thoughtful literature about these features of the illiberal left by left-leaning defenders of liberalism. Such supporters of democracy and human rights realize that these excesses of the left provide powerful resources for an increasingly illiberal right to rally a significant portion of the population. 
which has helped to place American constitutional democracy in its present peril. Dreher will sometimes write that he is a classic liberal at heart, by which he seems to mean that he appreciates in some way constitutional democracy and human rights. But in tension with this, he, all, he is also sympathetic with various anti-liberal or post-liberal critiques of liberalism that are so common in our time. Especially given the threat that Dreher perceives to Christians like himself from this impending pink police state, he contributed to some fledging efforts to foster a new nationalism under the heading of national conservatism. This movement is closely aligned with efforts by various conservatives in the United States to foster an overthrow of democratic rule for a more autocratic polity supportive of their social vision and usually funded by business persons with frightening social, social agendas re ranging from individualism to an economic libertarianism to oligarchy and minority rule. There's a uh, interesting article in the New Republic that just came out today that talks about some of that. There's lots, masses of literature on all this. It's really hard to keep up with it. Uh, more recently, Dreher has focused his energies on promoting the illiberal democracy of Viktor Orban's Hungary. Upon gaining office through electoral processes, Orban has proceeded to tame the media, reshape the courts, gerrymander the electoral system to implement a form of minority rule rooted in the Christian heritage of a post-Christian nation, drawing especially on ethno-nationalism as op an opposition to Muslim immigration. Dreher sees Orban's Hungary as providing much from which we can learn here in the United States, apparently thinking that uh, people sympathetic to his uh, Ben Op and the Christian dissidents he's looking to cultivate can help to usher in something along the lines of uh, Orban's illiberal democracy. To facilitate this new nationalism, Dreher floats various potential political leaders who have ranged from Tucker Carlson to Senator Josh Hawley to author J.D. Vance. Um, it's, it's pretty clear, whatever it means for Dreher to say that he is a classic liberal at heart, his alignment with strands of the increasingly illiberal right is unmistakable. There are several additional reasons why I think that especially Catholics should be very selective in what they take from the prolific Rod Dreher. First, I think that constitutional democratic states, with all their flaws, provide many aspects of the common good as the church rightly understands it. And indeed, its institutions are part of the common good. Thus, I find it indispensable to encourage the collapse of the struggling political order on which we depend for undefined nationalisms whose main historical precedents did not end well to understate things. Second, uh, Dreher himself admits that he is especially driven by fear, namely the fear that conservative Christians like himself will be persecuted by the contemporary leftists. He similarly describes himself as a catastrophist. By this he means that, he seems to mean that he's inclined to fear a rapid catastrophic collapse as opposed to more gradual change. Although I appreciate his intellectual honesty, I would argue on the other hand that it is a profound mistake to allow our reason to be distorted by passions like fear. And I think Dreher's failure to avoid this leads him to misread the political and social situation, which is one that, in my opinion, has especially suffered from the failure of Christians and Catholics to participate productively to provide the needed salt and light, as opposed to either retreating from a serious participation in society or in burning down the house, to uh, allude to a, a book about Newt Gingrich that I mentioned last time, or an article about him. Although Dreher provides much informative content on his blog, too many of his posts involve exposing and ridiculing the excesses of the illiberal left. Although this is effective clickbait because of the human vulnerability to fear and anger, I think it comes too close to fear mongering. 
and that such material can be not only addictive to readers, but it can thereby draw them into societal and political perspectives that are contrary to the common good in that it fosters tribalization, undermines constitutional democracy, and lessens the chance that humanity can face the challenges of our time. There is a reason why scripture advises so frequently to avoid fear, and I think Dreher would do well to uh, give more attention to it. Third, whereas Dreher's 2020 Live by, Not by Lies is a confident call to resist an impending soft totalitarianism of the left, he clearly misjudged the situation as he published and promoted the book at a time when the country narrowly avoided being overtaken by an authoritarian, authoritarianism of the right, one that he encouraged his readers to support. In, in one of his refreshing displays of intellectual honesty, he admits this lacuna himself and says he will address in a second edition of his book the fact that there is also the threat of a totalitarianism of the right. I look forward to seeing how he does this, given his participation in efforts to promote a new nationalism and illiberal democracy, which aligns him with forces working to topple American governance. Fourth, I would discourage especially Catholics from taking Rod Dreher as a guide to the social and political realm over a social Catholicism because his misjudgments are rooted in his failure to heed the Catholic warning about the ambiguous nature of ideologies as stated most explicitly by St. Paul VI, but consistent with the whole tradition of Catholic social thought. Although Dreher spends a considerable amount of time in his latest book criticizing the ideology of the illiberal left, he says little about the ideologies of the right. He has, however, criticized some of the most extreme right-wing ideas, such as the 2021 Jericho March and QAnon. Still, Dreher seems to assume, like, like many of my generation have, that conservatism provides an apt hermeneutical lens for looking at the social and political realm, pointing especially to the conservatism of Russell Kirk. It seems to me that this fundamentally conservative identity contributed to Dreher's prior support for the militarism of George W. Bush in the Iraq invasion that Dreher now so deeply regrets, just as it seems to have led him to misread the threats from the illiberal right in 2020 that's gonna to lead to a new edition of his book. He's certainly welcome to identify as a conservative, as do many contemporary Catholics. My point is that our tradition discourages such limited perspectives, especially in the social realm, and wisely offers a non-ideological, non-partisan approach uh, that to me is much better than uh, the alternatives. So fifth, although at times one might think that Dreher recognizes that Christians should be following a Christian social ethic, he shows little familiarity or sympathy with that tradition, tradition while promoting something else. I unpack that a little bit more, but to try to recover some time, I'll skip that. And then sixth, it seems to me that Dreher has a deficient understanding of hope, which I am, if I'm not mistaken, considers only, if not in theory, at least in practice, the ultimate end of beatific vision and Catholics should have a more adequate approach. According to an authority like St. Thomas Aquinas, we hope properly for beatific vision, but we can also hope in a lesser sense for all the good things we can attain with God's help. Without this robust Catholic sense of hope, we can easily focus on limited but laudable spiritual goals like persevering and transmitting the faith as in Dreher's Benedict option, but give up on seemingly impossible temporal goals, like saving the planet for future generations or building a human society worthy of the human person, building a global society worthy of the human person, with a robust Catholic sense of hope that includes the good things we can expect from God's help on the other hand, Catholics can take the lead in working for such noble goals in solidarity with the whole human family. Do we really think that it would be better to evangelize 
by taking. Um, or excuse me, let me start again. Do we really need to ask whether we would better evangelize by taking such a role or by doubling down on culture wars or by fear mongering? In any case, the above provides some of the initial reasons why I think Catholics should be very selective in the way they are influenced by Rod Dreher, despite many insightful things one can pick up by reading him. Three, metaphysical rejections of liberalism and the emergence of post-liberal thought. The most basic thing to say is that there is another very significant stream of thought that seems to be an alternative to social Catholicism. During the 1990s, I initially became aware of this general perspective through its articulation by David L. Schindler in an ongoing debate with Father, Father Richard Newhouse, who edited the neoconservative magazine First Things, a journal of religion and public thought. At the time, the label of post-liberalism wasn't in vogue, although arguments were being made that liberalism was corrupt from its metaphysical roots. At the heart of this debate was Father Newhouse's emphasis that we should contend for the version of American constitutional democracy or liberalism most, com most compatible with the fullness of Catholic truth, which made clear the practical program for Catholics. He saw it as self-evident that we had no alternative to working from within liberalism because we could not refound our constitutional democratic system. Schindler, on the other hand, argued that because liberalism was not rooted in the metaphysical truth of Trinitarian self-giving love, it did not provide, as its defenders claimed, a neutral environment in which the church could carry out its mission, but instead was slanted against Catholic, Catholic truth with all that implies. The main practical thrust of this medically, metaphysically centered approach was on the need to recover and foster the transcendentals, including beauty, goodness, and truth, which is a good insight. Throughout the 1990s and into the 2000s, it seemed that the Catholic neoconservatives had the upper hand over these radical anti-liberals, since the former's program aligned nicely with the growing conservative movement in the United States, with which Catholics increasingly identified. This alignment of neoconservatives at first things with American conservatism and the Republican Party included the neoliberal economics with its deregulation and tax cuts that had become a consensus position for post-Cold War globalization and with the militar militarism of the George W. Bush administration. It also aligned with support for a minimal state in the form of constitutional democracy combined with exaggerated anti-state rhetoric from Father Newhouse and an ongoing polemic against those who supported a more active state along the lines presumed by the social encyclicals. By the end of the Bush administration amidst the 2008 financial crisis and ongoing war in Iraq, almost coterminous with the death of Father Newhouse, the air came out of the neoconservative bubble and one could see a soul searching reappraisal of the future of conservatism in venues like First Things. In the last decade or so, even First Things under the editorship of Russell Reno has increasingly aligned with the anti-liberal or post-liberal perspective that David L. Schindler had earlier advanced, frequently publishing the related arguments of Michael Hanby. Whereas in the 1990s, radical critics of liberalism were a minority among Catholic scholars in the United States with philosopher Alistair McIntyre among the most noteworthy in the last decade, these positions have come to dominate among Catholics with defenders of constitutional democracy laying low in an age more sympathetic to the prolific and seemingly ubiquitous post-liberals. Among the most sophisticated arguments are those offered in various essays and the first two volumes of an expected trilogy by David C. Schindler, son of David L. Schindler. The first volume of this trilogy was published in 2019 with the title, Freedom from Reality, the Diabolical Character of Modern Liberty. And the second was published earlier this year and is entitled, The Politics of the Real, the Church Between Liberalism and Integralism. Since I'm approaching the end of my time, this is not the place to engage with these works of world-class scholarship. I would, however, like to offer a few brief preliminary observations and note some questions I would pose to post-liberals like David C. Schindler. 
Regarding my preliminary observations, my first point is that this work includes both radical and striking claims along with moderating explanations. For example, the subtitle of the first volume might seem to suggest that modern liberty is demonic, but it actually refers to Schindler's etymological recovery of the distinction between diabolical in the sense of driving apart or subverting versus symbolical, which connotes a joining together. Similarly, he argues, here's a long quote, that there is literally nothing good about liberalism per se. There is nothing good about it because, first of all, and according to its essence, it is a total, it is as total a rejection of Christianity as is possible. And moreover, by its nature, it is parasitical, something unreal in itself in the strict metaphysical sense of being privative, insofar as it is founded on a potency that exerts itself over actuality. It is not a reality, as we have seen, but a negation of reality, or perhaps a contrived conspiracy to negate reality. To put this in an extreme formulation, still quoting, understanding evil in the ontological sense of the privation of goodness, we could say that liberalism is evil as a political form." End quote. This above reflects the conclusion of a substantial argument, and I include it as an example of the radical critiques that are now common. Given the contemporary threats to constitutional democratic governance and the lack of alternatives that could feasibly be implemented, it seems to me that st such stinging critiques of the political forms underlying much of modern life contribute to a situation in which many Catholics are antagonistic toward constitutional democracy at a time when it is teetering on the brink. The impression I get from post-liberals is that the collapse is inevitable, after which a more post-liberal alternative informed by certain Catholic perspectives could be established. But it seems to me that the more likely alternative is a mix of right-wing authoritarianism and kleptocracy. I would argue that constitutional democracy, even if it, it is always in need of massive reforms, should be understood as part of the, un, the common good as understood by Catholic social teaching, namely as the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. Despite the undeniable deficiencies of modern constitutional democracies, there are a wide array of measures by which they have approved, approved, improved human life. Whether in vastly increased lifespans, improved health, basic education, support for human rights, and so on. Well aware of this, Dave C. Schindler goes on to write that, another long quote, the genuinely good things of modern existence, which have emerged inside of the horizon of liberalism, and in some sense, only there, may be seen from this perspective as the irrepressible fruits of nature, fruitfulness of nature, the ever surprising inventiveness of human culture and freedom, the deeply creative resource of tradition, which is able to turn even the radical negativity of liberalism to its own use to achieve something humanly beneficial and even glorious. Can we say that these benefits are the fruits of liberalism? Yes, but only in the sense that, for example, the most precious treasures of Christian dogma are the fruits of heresy, in response to which they first emerged, fruits that may never have existed otherwise. So here we have a qualified affirmation of the many good things that are widely recognized to exist in liberal societies. So trying to show that Schindler both has very you know, provocative statements and then very moderating statements. So uh, a fundamental question that comes to mind regarding this academic work on post-liberalism to, to which I have not seen an answer is the following. That is whether it would, and I'm gonna include some quotes in my big question from some of the things that we just read from uh, Dave C. Schindler, whether it would without having achieved a new post-liberal order, uh, but to address the urgent challenges of our day, whether it would if we can't, if they can't actually establish a new order informed by these Catholic views, whether it would encourage Catholics to live out the integral and solidary humanism of the compendium or the social friendship and solidarity of Pope Francis, whether it would basically encourage uh, a living out of social Catholicism 
uh, short of refounding a new constitutional order, a new order. Even though they might follow Schindler in seeing the secular order as inherently but indirectly ordered to the true end, and even though they might be cooperating subversively to infuse the world with the spirit of Christ, could they not see such efforts as an opportunity, as Schindler writes, to even turn the radical negativity of liberalism to its own use, to achieve something humanly beneficial and even glorious? So just a couple words to conclude. So I'm asking the question, you know, of, um, you know, what, what do we do in, uh, in lieu of reestablishing an order? Uh, it seems to me that Catholicism in the United States is dominated by perspectives that are difficult to align with the Christian humanism of Catholic social teaching. In my view, this is a colossal mistake, understandable in part by some of the excesses of the liberal left that have helped push Catholics towards the right, but a mistake nevertheless. I think this mistake also helps to explain why we have failed so badly in realizing the renewal of the church and society envisioned by the fathers of the Second Vatican Council. A much more promising path is to simply live out the life of charity and the mission of integral evangelization as indicated by our social teaching, which by which we can avoid tribal or partisan identities and perceived threats from the liberal left. Um, I hope that today's lecture will encourage many to do so. Thank you, Dr. Murphy, for a lively presentation. So we will open it up first to questions from people on site and then after to those who are joining us online. Yes. Dr. Murphy, can you talk about the relationship between social friendship and synodality? So the question is on the relationship between social friendship and synodality. That's that's a really interesting question, because uh, Pope Francis is both encouraging us to focus on social social friendship as our basic stance towards society, and then within the church, he's encouraging a uh, a synodality, a walking together as fellow disciples, involving everyone. So I I think they they go together uh, quite uh, quite well. The uh, Synodality sort of presupposes a walking together in charity where we respect the dignity of each person, we respect their gifts, and we try to collaborate to uh, further the mission of the church. So I, I think they go together very well. It's almost the, uh, the odd extra approach is a social friendship in the world, and the odd intra approach is an ecclesial friendship. Uh, yeah. The question is, if Pope Francis is in continuity with the tradition of Catholic social doctrine, why is there so much difficulty accepting his vision, particularly here in the United States? That, that's a great mystery. I was focused on some of the, you know, the intellectual reasons why you give me a chance to restate, you know, that, that what I was trying to achieve is shed light on some of the intellectual reasons why. Uh, some, sometimes it can also be that he's, he seems very different to us. We're not used to a pope from Latin America. And, uh, you know, and he, he has a different way of speaking than, uh, you know, than Pope Francis or John Paul II. And uh, I think he has a different, he, he's very much focused on, on the most vulnerable. And we're, we're not as used to that in the United States. We're really so deeply influenced by this individualism that we're more, uh, in tune to ba basically looking at the world from our own, you know, as, as an egocentric perspective. And I think he's completely focused on, you know, who who is the most vulnerable and who who can he reach out to. Uh, but the the main part of the answer is I think there there's really rivals out there in the United States. You know, the intellectual part of the uh, and and they're they're very well funded by if if you study the history of uh, you know, of the social changes that have emerged in the last uh, several decades in the United States, there's really been kind of the building up 
of a, uh, a whole network of sources to promote a different vision. And you know, ca Catholics have gotten very aligned with that. They became part of a uh, uh, an alliance that was built up over over the, these moral issues. And it was actually conceived by a combination of uh, there was a guy named Paul Weirich who funded a lot of the uh, think tanks and was a Republican operative. And uh, Pat Buchanan was a uh, a Catholic working for Richard Nixon and then in other administrations. But but there's a strategy that the coalition was was built by political operatives and then funded by uh, uh, dark money, as in that book by uh, Jane Meyer that I mentioned. So you know, uh, there, there's really a, a need to uh, become more familiar with what's going on in recent decades to understand how it could possibly be that what Pope Francis says or what the social documents say looks so different from what we presume to be the right way to look at things in the United States. There was another question over. So the question is in response to um, the discussion of the Benedict Option by Rod Dreher and uh, asks Dr. Murphy to consider whether the communitarian aspect that Dreher highlights and identifies particularly on the conservative side could also be applicable more broadly um, and therefore would be a useful framework for moving forward with social Catholicism. That, thank you, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, commentators on the political realm will, will often uh, contrast the individualism that characterizes American society with a more communitarian perspective as, as, as coming from a Catholic tradition or, you know, various political philosophers have also, uh, you know, articulated that kind of an approach. So, uh, you know, I, I think that Dreher is well read enough and smart enough to be aware of that. And it, it uh, so he has a, you know, a certain, he sees that communi community very much, it seems to me, as rooted in small Christian communities. Uh, and that's a, that's a good thing. I think that's uh, as, as far as it goes. But um, I think a, a Catholic view would have more of, a, uh, of, an, of an identity as, as part of the whole society and uh, and also globally. So yes, we have our fundamental identity as a Christian and as a member of the church, uh, but we're also a member of, uh, you know, Mundelein, Illinois, and an American and, and a member of the human family. So I, I see his approach as even though he rightly emphasizes communitarianism, I, I see it from a Catholic perspective, it's too narrow. It's, it's too narrow. Um, the question has to do with the concept of distributive justice, which can be traced back to Leo the 13th in Rerum Novarum, and wondering has the theme of distributive justice been displaced in Catholic social tradition in favor of social justice? And is that displacement part of some of these current controversies? That, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think I have a, a crisp answer for it, but I know that if, like if you look at the history of Catholic social teaching in the United States, it was obvious to somebody like a Monsignor John Ryan, who I mentioned last year, that uh, we, you know, we needed a much more extensive articulation of distributive justice. And so that was one of his big works is he wrote he wrote a big work on distributive justice. And he in, in that you know, this is in the context of the Industrial Revolution, the 1930s, 40s, that time frame, you know, he 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 had to he had he had to get into the weeds of uh, industrial policy and relations between you know laborers and uh, industrialists and so he he gives a good example of the need to uh, you know to give a robust articulation of that uh, you know in in contemporary parlance somebody like a Rod Dreher would would take the notion of social justice as articulated by the social justice warriors on the left who would be trying to implement political correctness or speech codes or something like that by, you know, by stepping on people's rights and coercing them. So, you know, all these terms need to be defined and articulated in a robust way. And I think we have a, coming at it out of the Catholic tradition, you know, gives us good ways to do that, to give a, you know, a good account of distributive justice, a good account of, uh, yeah, you know, what we mean by uh, social justice. Uh, Thank you, 
you, Dr. Murphy. So in, in our church history class, we just finished learning about the church's long and slow transition from supporting monarchies as being extremely, uh, as being most combat, um, compatible with theology, most conducive to Christian life, to constitutional liberal democracy as being most compatible with our theology, most conducive to Christian life. And my, um, it seems that you have presented the dichotomy as either supporting liberal democracy or knocking it down. Is it possible that we're effectively in a 1791 moment where we have to learn how to live with a liberal democracy? Thank you. So the question is, the seminarian recalls from recent study of church history that the Catholic <laughs> Church shifted from uh, an appreciation of monarchy as most consistent with its values to eventually constitutional liberal democracy and is wondering whether this is a new 1791 moment for us in as Catholics, particularly in the United States, where we have to learn how best to live with illiberal democracy or there is an optimal solution to escape that trap. That, that's a great question. It's good to take classes uh, and study these things. The, uh, it, it could be, uh, I mean, and it seems most likely right now that the illiberal democracy that we would live with would be one of the right. I mean, that, it seems most likely. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that poses a lot of dangers for the church. I mean, my, my wife grow, grew up in Spain under um, Franco, so, where you had all kinds of uh, carrots and sticks to be Catholic, and people weren't very Catholic. You know, the, the, uh, and the countries in that situation uh, secularized very quickly when the, when the, uh, uh, the coercion is lifted. So I, I don't think you get real Catholics. <laughs> in too many real Catholics in that environment. Uh, you get more money, the, you have more prestige for leaders, but I, I don't think it's very, very conducive. And, and the frightening thing to me, when you look into the future of what that would look like, you, you know, you, th that kind of illiberal democracy would, you know, we, would, would be accelerating climate change, you know, you know the right wing version, there, there'd be no attention to, uh, you know, trying to limit those changes, which is going to result in massive uh, migration. And so you're going to have to build wall. You're going to have to have, you know, military battalions with tanks lined up at the borders to be shooting, you know, the, the waves of immigrants that are going to be coming. So to me, it seems pretty horrific for, you know, a prospect of a church aligned with, you know, a really aggressive right wing illiberal democracy. I don't think it's going to be very I mean, the, the church would become, to me, a, you know, a despised thing for collaboration and, uh, you know, grave injustices. Uh, I, th I think we'd be much better off uh, living our tradition and being at the forefront of trying to address the real changes and treat everybody with, res with respect. Uh, I, think, I think that's the way you win the future. Yeah, I think it's a, a lot of discussion are centering upon what is the most pressing problem because it's like a lot of the European discussions are centering around the most pressing problem in Europe is uh, you know, getting European continent becoming more and more, uh, not only secular, but Muslim. And so it's uh, in the France is right now on the tipping point and the people are not, uh, are not integrating into the society. So you have those, uh, those groups and the fear of and the fear of a lot of European countries of becoming Muslim and consequently embracing Sharia law, or the situation, or the situation of the Muslim majority in which, in which, like you can have in Nigeria, which uh, which you have the, that kind of the, the situation when you have the, the situation of the uh, of the. Uh, the situation of, uh, of Boko Haram and stuff like that, which you have a great minority of Catholics, majority of the Muslims, and those different kinds of atrocities are happening. And so that's what is the situation in Europe. And that's why I think Orban and the different kinds of, uh, different kinds of uh, situation, I think that's what is happening. I think in the States, in the States, uh, the most pressing problem the most pressing problem is uh, 
the most pressing problem that it's uh, a lot of people are uh, looking looking at its inequality and and cancel culture. That is what people will say. That is the most pressing uh, pressing problem. Obviously, for for Francis, the most pressing problem is different. So because of that, the tension within in the, in the, in your presentation, there is also you presented the most uh, pressing problems, and that's I think a lot of the question would be, are those the most pressing problems? The question is, uh, does the shape of Catholic social Catholicism, is it affected by what one deems to be the most pressing problems of the day? And if you look at the context of Europe, for example, countries like France dealing with Muslim integration or even questions in Nigeria where Boko and Boko Haram, some of the Muslim majority versus a Catholic minority have been violent, that that's a more pressing issue there compared to here where pressing issues widely are seen as maybe a combination of cancel culture and inequality. And so is the shape of your social Catholicism enhanced or limited by what you deem as the most pressing problems? That's that's a great question. You can see, you know, that there are uh, good reasons why people have different, you know, emphases in these matters. Uh, it the, the the you know how how one weighs something like the horror of you know millions of elective abortions against uh, you know the threat of an uninhabitable planet this century um, you know it it's hard to do the calculates that's a, there's it's, there's not a uh, you know a, a formula that makes it obvious how to do those calculations but uh, it it seems to me that uh, the, the Catholic tradition you know very very much and rightly supports uh, constitutional democratic governance of some kind that respects human rights and uh, respects the dignity of different people. And then within that, you know, if, if there's a model of working as friends to address the changes, you, you can, uh, you know, in, in a spirit of friendship as opposed to, you know, looking at tribal enemies to try to address the changes. It seems that different countries will probably weigh those different uh, challenges differently and uh, and it, but it doesn't seem I, I mean I, I would think almost any country if you had broad democratic uh, input almost everybody would be concerned about the you know the things like climate change and the global warming and, and would want uh, you know a reasonable standard of living almost everybody I think would want those things so they, they would be on the agenda uh, now, how many people in a country like Hungary, where there's just a small fraction of um, of Christians, would uh, I, I, I guess they uh, th there's a reasonable percentage of them who are very concerned about the Muslim in immigration, but uh, I, I, and anyway, uh, I, I got off track there, but things are challenging. There's different ways to look at it, but I, I think the social Catholicism could allow those things to be addressed differently uh, in different countries based on kind of a, a, participa a participation by the broad population to, to weigh what each country uh, sees as most pressing. I'm going to read one of our online questions. Thank you for your lecture, Dr. Murphy. You mentioned about the need as Catholics to listen to the Pope even when he is not speaking ex cathedra. A survey across comments on social media suggests that many Catholics in America seem to have forgotten about this need. I was wondering if you would say more about the importance of this aspect of listening to the Pope and being obedient to him, even when he is not speaking ex cathedra. And perhaps where I could read more on this topic. Thank you. God bless. Th thank you very much for that question. Uh, nothing is coming to mind as to where we to read more about it, but let, let me just uh, say a few things about how I, I would approach that. You know, of uh, I, I think that we we basically want to uh, have a have an attitude of sympathy and and learning. You know, with what the Pope has to say, and you know, it's not. You know, a lot of people would uh, react negatively to you know 
if it were just presented as just obey whatever the Pope says, because that's really, I don't think that's really the, you know, the right role. But I, I think having a fundamental sympathy and, you know, for, for me, you know, growing up in uh, the John Paul II era, it was very, I, I had to invest time in working through uh, probably four volumes trying to explain who Pope Francis was so that I could really see, you know, that he, uh, where he was coming from and why I should listen to him. So depend, different, different people will be able to come to a more, a greater appreciation and sympathy with the Holy Father through different approaches. But uh, I, I think it's a question of uh, striving to do whatever we have to do to uh, to try to learn what the Pope has to say to us. I think we need to strive for that. And for different people, it can uh, it, that can be accomplished in different ways. For me, I had to read four books uh, uh, and think about it, think about it and pray about it a lot. But you know, I came to really, I think if we can appreciate him as really a, a, a man of the gospel and somebody who wants to bring uh, uh, our Lord to people, uh, we can uh, we can learn, but but it might take take some striving to uh, to be able to receive what he has to say. Dr. Murray, uh, you're a little worried coming in cold, heavy not. I need to tune in for the second lecture, so I'm going to try not to ask quite the question in a way that it's probably what you addressed in the second lecture, but the doubling down on a failed approach, like brought to mind like something my pastor at the parish I was at kind of kept hammering that comes, I think, from the Gallup group that shows up in Catholic circles too, of like, we got to stop doing the behave, believe, belong, and we got to move to like a belong, believe, behave model. And which uh, I think there's a lot that can be said of like, well, what does it mean to belong, which might be kind of the second talk of it. I was wondering, is that perhaps what you're getting at of like almost that this the first alternative is that sort of like we well, got to start with behave, then you can believe and belong. And it's like, well, if we went to like some sort of belong, believe, behave, then maybe we could defend the, you know, Catholic teach, especially very kind of splendor on like these intrinsic evils. So like, you know, that the, that approach may actually be more effective anyways. It's, 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 it's the belong, believe, behavior you kind of getting that. Perhaps that was the second talk, but I uh, was just curious your thoughts on that. Uh, so in reference to the first uh, part of your critique, um, if Catholics focused more, maybe another way of rephrasing it would be on their belonging, their sense of identity, and also their behavior, um, would that be a way to reframe things and, and avoid some of the culture wars and be more effective? Yeah, I, I think that just this idea of uh, mentory to the message that I was trying to give, the uh, but but the, the we're talking more about uh, you know with the focus on the intrinsic evil that's really um, the the way that's been presented is that this should be people's primary concern when engaging in the social and political realm and uh, yeah I think there's maybe there's an analogy to like a, a morality of just telling people to behave uh, so I, I think there's there's a kind of a parallel there to that and I think the approach of of, of a social Catholicism is is very much uh, on uh, recognizing your connectedness to not just the church community but solidarity with everybody, and so there's kind of a there's a sense of belonging uh, to the whole human family that that comes along with that. So given that some concepts like a spirituality of synodality or the social Catholicism that you're articulating are very rich concepts that we'll have to wrestle with for a long time to mine more deeply, um, maybe perhaps you could give us a preview of in the spring, your next lecture, what you see is most fruitful and what solution you might be offering for us on the social Catholicism piece. Those, those are good questions. I think I'd have to, uh, I have to think about the next lecture. That's you know what I'm going to do. I, I was thinking about digging more into the post-liberalism, but you know some of the practical things of how we uh, focus on on living out this vision more in in a church that's going through a process of synodality. That that's an interesting uh, 
uh, topic to think about. I, I do think, like I said in answer to one of the earlier questions, that there's really a uh, uh, a close relation between looking at the social realm with an attitude of friendship, which is really just living out charity. I mean, I, 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 I just, the, the more I teach moral theology, the more I think the focus is, the essence of it is really, uh, you know, living in a, a kind of a charity modeled by friendship. You know, that, that really is kind of like one of my professors used to talk about, like a tuning fork to hold up to your ear. I mean, it seems to me that if you're really approaching people in an attitude of friendship, concerned about their good and wanting to uh, help them and serve them, I think that answers, you know, that's just the right way to live in the social realm in, in, in any way, or the right, right way to live uh, synodality in the church as we try to figure out a more, a more fruitful uh, way for the church to go forward in, in our daily life, you uh, know, way, a way that gathers all the, you know, the gifts together, that recognizes all the gifts and puts them all to work. Uh, this, this basic attitude of re relating to people in friendship and not, as I think the mistake that Roger Rare makes, fundamentally looking at all the threats and, and reacting out of fear. Like, how can I, you know, do what I can do to uh, prevent being uh, coerced by these mean lefties? I mean, they, they do, a lot of lives have been ruined by the soft totalitarianism of the left. And, you know, Dreher does a great, every time he, he has an army of people who feed him stories. So every, very frequently, he's got an example of somebody losing their job. But uh, so there, there's reasons why people react out of fear, but it's a huge mistake. It's, it's not, I mean, it, it, it's, that's to live, as St. Paul would say, out of the flesh, or for Thomas, it's to live according to the sensate nature. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, it's kind of very simple. If, if you get the message about living in charity, living in friendship, uh, you've got the whole thing. Take one final question. Returning to uh, my prior question about the church and post, um, the church and post-liberalism, it was less about, it was a question about the church and the post-liberal world and about liberalism as a body of thought, as a system of thought, and how do we, that's going to be the prevailing culture, right or left, how do we <coughs> navigate that intellectually? So the question is if post-liberalism is the great intellectual challenge that we have to deal with right now, whether it's the post-liberalism on the left or the post-liberalism on the right, what's the best way to intellectually engage that body of literature. You know, these streams of thought that are now gathering under the heading of post-liberalism have been uh, building for, you know, decades now. And, you know, what role they'll have in the future, I, I, I think it's somewhat undetermined because uh, there's not, it's not clear. I mean, there are some people who are getting more concrete about what they think it should look like now, but how you get from there to from here to there. I mean, we we can you know it's so hard to pass a constitutional amendment or something like that. And if you just sort of overthrow the government, uh, you know what do what do you get? You get some kind of an authoritarian uh, regime usually. So, I mean, I I'm hoping that you know the best forms of of post liberalism will stop. Uh, sort of beating the drums on liberalism in a way that takes constitutional democracy with it, you know, start, stop beating on that and, and talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, how by, by living out, uh, you know, a, a Catholic uh, social vision, you, you, we, we can make the, ch we, we can foster the changes needed in, you know, constitutional democratic states. And I think those changes need to be you know, we, we if, if we don't address, you know, the the, the move, movement away from a carbon based economy, you know, we're we're in big trouble. You know, I'm old enough that it's not going to be that big of a problem for me. But a lot of you guys are younger. There's going to be massive waves of immigrants. Uh, you know, they're going to be displaced. Uh, so you have problems like that, problems like the inequality. You know, if, if one looks into the way that the economy has become rigged by these people who built the think tanks, and uh, and and the the influencers of thought 
to, to basically allow you know, the economy to evolve the way it is. I, that has to be remedied because you know you have you know the, the percentage of people who don't have any money in their bank accounts and have have zero net worth is you know it's massive and growing. And uh, you know Elon Musk's net worth grew by I think it's two and a quarter, the two hundred and twenty five billion dollars the other day. There was a reevaluation of Tesla. I mean, I, nobody cracked a hundred billion dollars of of uh, net worth uh, until recently. Bill Gates, I think, was the first one who hit a hundred. In one day, his net worth went up. I believe that's the number. Check it. It was yesterday. They, they there was a story. I think it went up by two hundred and. It's it's outrageous the, the amount of the concentration of wealth that's happening, and uh, so questions like that, and I I think also questions of uh, democratic governance. I think that's really key because if you, if you lose that, as, as dysfunctional as it is right now, uh, what do you get? Um, well, we'll look forward perhaps to a spring lecture where you explain how social friendship can be a tool to help us save constitutional democracy <laughs> and remedy extreme inequality. So we'll look forward to that. Thank you all those here on site and online for participating and thank you especially uh, to Dr. Bill Murphy for his wonderful and lively lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie.